these are my disclosures. When discussing the diagnosis of uh, fulvirulent disease, I would like to start with some basic principles that uh, fulvirulent disease is a bleeding disorder that is uh, caused by inherited defects in the concentration or function of fulvirulent factor. And to make a proper diagnosis, we need testing of the functions of fulvirulent factor being the ad, uh, supporting the adhesion of platelets and carrying uh, factor VIII. The diagnostic criteria consist of, of course, a bleeding phenotype, and that bleeding phenotype uh, can either be a personal history of bleeding and also a family history of bleeding. Then we have, of course, also the laboratory phenotype characterized by reduced levels of fulvirulent factor and or factor VIII. And making a curate, uh, accurate diagnosis is important because this has implications for the treatment, either treatment with DDAVP or for William factor concentrates, and it has also implications for counseling. The classification of fulvirulent disease uh, was uh, for the last time published in 2006 by a SSC communication uh, by F. N. Settler, and uh, the classification still holds up to today. And we have type 1 fulvirulent disease. This is characterized by a partial quantitative deficiency of fulvirulent factor. And uh, we have the type 3, which is characterized by a complete deficiency of fulvirulent factor. Where in type 3, the mutations are mainly uh, null alleles. In type 1, most mutations are actually missense mutations, and only a minority uh, are null alleles. All the other subtypes are uh, subtypes of type 2, which are all cover. Qualitative, qualitative defects of fulvirulent uh, factor, either due to the lack of the large fulvirulent factor multimers, characterized as type 2A, or a specific mutation in the GP1B binding domain, making fulvirulent factor adhere spontaneously to platelets, mutations in the same area when they lead to a loss of function of this uh, GP1B binding area result in a type 2M, and a characteristic of this is that the multimers are uh, normal. Also in this category are categorized defects in the collagen binding. And finally we have type 2N which is characterized by a defective binding of factor 8 to fulvirulent factor. Most types are uh, autosomal dominant in the type 2, only type 2N has a recessive inheritance. Although the cat classification is clear cut, the question mark is how to get there, how to get to the right diagnosis. For that, we first have to focus on how to assess uh, the bleeding history. And for that, we like to assess the severity and the likelihood of a bleeding uh, tendency, which is characterized by the age of onset. The younger the age at the first symptoms, the more likely that it is that there is a bleeding tendency. This also is true for spontaneous versus traumatic bleeding, the frequency of bleeding, and uh, whether there are bleeding at multiple sites. All these aspects make it more likely that there really is a bleeding history. And in fulvirulent disease, the manifestations of those bleedings are uh, of mucocutaneous nature, which means that there are bruises or minor wounds that bleed more uh, severely, bleeding from gums or epistaxis, menorrhagia in women, and gastrointestinal bleeds. But, Apart from those spontaneous bleedings, there are also bleedings after uh, challenges, and those challenges are mainly surgery, tooth extraction, but also trauma and delivery. But it's often difficult to um, guess how severe really this bleeding tendency is. And for that, over the past uh, decade, uh, bleeding assessment tools has become uh, more important. And these tools are uh, designed to give a somewhat, some kind of quantitative rating to the bleeding uh, severity. It is, uh, consists of a structured bleeding questionnaire and a numerical scoring system. And one, well, it's not for you to read, but this is just one of the tables from the paper of uh, the European Type 1 Fulvirulent Disease Group, uh, authored by Tosetto, and in these scoring systems you have the symptoms, the bleeding symptoms, and here you have the uh, scoring you get depending on the severity of the specific symptoms. So if there is uh, either you need to have a attendance to a physician or whether you need blood transfusion, the more severe, the higher the score you get. And uh, those bleeding scores have been uh, 
uh, evolved and finally uh, they have been uh, endorsed by the ISTH and there is also a online version of the bleeding score. But how good are those scores to really apply in the uh, diagnostic setting? They are definitely useful to more or less give a quantification of the severity of bleeding when you uh, uh, do research to compare groups of patients uh, that may have different medians of severity of bleeding. But for the individual patient, it's difficult to uh, use because the scoring system is strongly dependent on the age and of the patient and the number of events that have been uh, experienced. And uh, you can see that over here on the left here are affected family members and on the right here are index cases. And you see with increasing age, this score uh, increases just because you accumulate more challenges over time. So the absolute value of the score is difficult to interpret. In this uh, graph on the right, there is a relationship between higher scores and the risk to seat and the activity of virulent factors, so lower activity is correlated with higher scores, but you can see immediately that there is an enormous overlap, so it's very difficult to uh, pinpoint clearly the severity of the score for the individual patient. So for the clinical diagnosis, uh, they may be of limited value, whereas they may be very important in comparison in research. After screening uh, or, or assessing the bleeding phenotype, Usually, uh, some, uh, when you have a patient suspected for a bleeding disorder, you do some uh, sc uh, screening test of hemostasis, often a screening test for primary hemostasis and secondary hemostasis. They do not have an important role in the diagnosis of virulent disease. They are mainly important to, to exclude other causes of the bleeding. But then, when we move on to really the diagnosis of virulent disease, we have uh, two levels of tests. We have the first level of tests that are really the diagnostic tests, and we have a second level of tests that are more important for making the subtype or the classification. If you first look to the uh, tests that are essential for the diagnosis itself, the first level test, they comprise tests that really measure the amount of antigen present. There is a test that measures the uh, platelet-dependent uh, function of virulent factor, and uh, also factor eight is measured. So with the, a set of these three tests, you can already exclude or confirm that there is a virulent disease, only this is not sufficient yet to make the specific uh, classification. First, the antigen test. There are several tests. Often it's measured by an ELISA test, but of course this is uh, a little bit laborious. Uh, but uh, later on also automated uh, latex immunoassays have been developed. And in a European study, we have compared those tests in a large cohort of uh, familial disease patients, and actually they uh, correlate very well, only at very high familial factor levels, levels uh, above 150%. There seems to be some overestimation in the LIA test, but in general, there is a good correlation. Uh, the advantage of the LIA test, of course, is that it's automated. Um, it has a high precision, only a CV of about 2%, uh, which is somewhat better than the ELISA but the disadvantage is that the lower limit of detection is not as low as in the ELISA. Then we have the functional test of uh, uh, estimating the uh, platelet-dependent functional virulent factor, and historically for that we used the risk-to-seating cofactor activity assay. In that assay, uh, fixed donor platelets with the plasma of the patient by adding of risk-to-seatin uh, the filament factor in the patient's plasma is activated and starts to bind to the donor platelets. And uh, this aggregation is measured and is, is a measure for the functional activity of filament factor. But the problem of this assay is that it has a low sensitivity and the precision is also not very good. Another disadvantage is that more recently some variants in the filament factor gene have been identified that actually do not uh, cause bleeding, but they interfere with the binding of the risk to seat into the virulent factor, and thereby virulent factor is not activated that well by risk to seat in, which leads to a underestimation of the risk to seat in cofactor activity, activity, so a falsely reduced level that does not really reflect the real activity. More recently, only the last few years, new assays have been developed to measure this same function, but in a different way. There is a assay uh, developed 
in which a recombinant uh, GP1B, so the receptor on platelets uh, is a recombinant protein of that is coupled to latex particles and uh, in that way uh, the particles can bind uh, via this glycoprotein 1B filament factor and the particles start to agglutinate which is a measure for the function of the filament factor. There is an assay that still uses ristocetin for the activation of filament factor. Of course, this assay still has the problem that it may underestimate uh, per, uh, individuals having those variants. But a newer assay uh, uses a mutant variant of the glycoprotein 1B receptor, uh, which is actually a mutant that is also present in uh, platelet type filament disease. And this uh, um, glycoprotein 1B binds to filament factor spontaneously without the need for uh, activation of filament factor by ristocetin. Then there is another assay uh, which is now formally uh, named uh, VWFAB because it's not really an activity assay although it's been marketed like that but this is a, a monoclonal antibody assay where the monoclonal antibody binds to the functional epitope in filament factor. It Although it correlates very well with the ristocetin cofactor activity, it is, in strict sense, not an activity assay. Well, after those uh, assays, we uh, move on to the um, subtyping assay, so the second level tests. And there are several tests required to make the specific subclassification of virulent disease. First, we have the ristocetin induced platelet aggregation, the multimer analysis the binding of factor A to filament factor, and sometimes also the collagen binding assay is used. And finally, I will also uh, discuss some aspects on the filament factor propeptide assay, although this is not uh, part of the current classification scheme. Well, the restocetin-induced platelet uh, aggregation assay uh, is important to distinguish a type 2B filament disease because ristocetin induces the conformational change of filament factor and that leads to binding to the GP1B. But in patients with type 2B filament disease, there is a mutation in filament factor that induces a change in the protein in a way that it does not have to be activated but binds spontaneously to uh, the GP1B. So in the ristocetin induced platelet aggregation assay, no or only very low concentrations of ristocetin are already enough to make the filament factor bind to the platelet. So there is an enhanced ristocetin-induced platelet aggregation in type 2B. We also see the same phenotype in the so-called platelet type filament disease, which in fact is a defect of the platelets where there is a gain of function mutation in the glycoprotein 1B receptor and similarly then there is a spontaneous binding to filament factor. So also with this defect you will have an enhanced uh, ristocetin-induced platelet aggregation. To make a real distinction between these two you will need genetic testing for the type 2B mutation. Usually it's primarily done. Then the multimer analysis. In the multimer analysis plasma samples are in a non-reduced fashion run on an agarose gel this can either be on a medium uh, resolution or a low resolution gel. And what you see over here, on the left you have normal plasma, the pattern of the multimers. In type 1 you have a completely normal pattern, although it's just lower in concentration because there's less protein. In type 2a for filament disease you have a complete lack of the larger uh, multimers. And here's also another type of type 2a, you have a lack of the large multimers. Here you see an example of a type 2b. Um, there is often also a lack of the largest multimers, but this is not on the production side. It's cleared from the circulation due to the spontaneous binding to the platelets. But what you see in plasma is actually a lack of the largest multimers. And in type 3, there's no protein, so you will not see any multimers. Well, there are several uh, different mutations that can cause type 2A. And uh, in detailed uh, multimer analysis by Ulrich Bude, uh, there are not only uh, always a complete lack of those large multimers, there may be a more subtle defects of the large multimers. So here's a normal pattern, but here you see there's a subtle defect of the large multimers, but they're all individual, unique changes uh, that are clearly directly related to the type of mutation that is present in the patient. So it's not only the size of the multimers, but also individual bending patterns that may be different. Then the factor 8 binding assay. 
This is relevant to uh, detect uh, type 2N for Willebrand disease, where there is a defect in the binding of factor A to for Willebrand factor. And in this uh, assay, this is a, usually set up as a ELISA type of assay, where for Willebrand factor is coated to the ELISA plate, the endogenous factor 8 is removed, and then fixed amounts of factor 8 are added, and it's measured how much factor 8 is bound to the virulent factor that had already been bound to the ELISA plate. And you have here the virulent factor, higher levels of virulent factor, and here you have the factor 8. And the more factor 8 is bound to the virulent factor, uh, you have a normal binding, but this is a heterozygous patient with a type 2N mutation, so it can bind less factor 8. And here you have a real uh, type 2N patient, and you see very low binding of factor 8 to virulent factor. And you need this assay to distinguish individuals that you suspect of type 2 and to distinguish it, this from mild hemophilia A. The collagen binding assay is uh, not used by all laboratories, and this has to do also with some standardize, standardization issues. Uh, actually, virulent factor binds also to collagen, and uh, collagen types 1 and 3 uh, bind to the A3 domain of virulent factor, whereas collagen type uh, five and four and six binds to uh, the, uh, the A1 domain. However, most commercial assays for the uh, collagen binding assay actually only have uh, these types of collagen. When is the collagen binding assay uh, abnormal? So when it's decreased, so of course it's a reflection of the amount of protein. So if the antigen level is lower, like in type 1 and type 3, you will have a reduced collagen binding assay. But more specifically, if you have a lack of large multimers, then you will also see a reduction in the collagen binding assay, and that you can see, for instance, in type 2A and type 2B. Then there are very few, but there are some specific mutations categorized among type 2M for Willebrand disease where the multimers are normal, uh, so you do not pick that, uh, uh, may not pick it up in a uh, risocetin activity assay, uh, but there may be a specific binding defect uh, only of virulent factor to uh, collagen, and that, th those defects you may only pick up with a collagen binding assay. So uh, in general, the collagen binding assay is more or less as efficient as uh, the risocetin cofactor activity. It can equally well distinguish between type 2 and type 1 for Willem disease, only if there are unique specific collagen binding defects, you may miss this when you have no collagen binding assay in your uh, setup. Then finally, I would like to uh, say something about the virulent factor propeptide assay. Virulent factor propeptide is a part of the protein that during its synthesis is cleaved off from uh, virulent factor. Uh, and it's stored together with formulament factor in the uh, viable palladar bodies, in the endothelium, and the alpha granules in the platelets. But up on secretion, they are both secreted in equimolar amounts into the plasma. Um, however, the clearance from the plasma is different, where the propeptide has a quite short half-life, only two to three hours, whereas the uh, formulament factor antigen, the mature protein, has a half-life of about 12 hours. But they uh, circulate in a fixed ratio in the plasma, and um, the ratio may change when there are changes due to, due to mutations uh, of, for instance, the uh, antigen. So if you have a low virulent factor antigen in an individual, but you also have a low virulent factor propeptide level, then there's probably a defect in the synthesis of the entire protein. However, when the propeptide is still normal at normal levels, while the antigen level is low, then probably the virulent factor antigen is cleared faster from the circulation. Um, it's not part of the official classification, as I already said, but it may learn us something about the, and understand about the pathophysiology of a specific uh, virulent disease patient. And we have uh, analyzed this in a large cohort in the European uh, virulent disease type 1 study. And here you see the propeptide uh, over the antigen ratio as determined in a large group of healthy controls, and the ratio is just around uh, one. And it's uh, only with a few exceptions, but generally it's all having a normal ratio. Among those patients, we had a group of patients which we could not identify a mutation, and strikingly, all those individuals had a normal propeptide of antigen ratio. 
Whereas in a group of patients where we did find mutations, a large set of those uh, individuals had high to very high levels of uh, very high propeptide over antigen uh, ratio. So uh, in those type 1 patients, fast clearance of the antigen plays a major beneficial role. And here we have uh, from left to the right along the protein all the mutations that were identified in this study and you see here a cluster of mutations with very high propeptide of antigen ratio and that is in the uh, D3 and the A1 domain so that there's probably an area over there that if you have mutations there in the protein this may lead to very fast clearance of virulent factor. Shortly here on the y-axis, again, we have the propeptide over the antigen ratio, but on the x-axis, we have the ratio between factor 8 and the virulent factor antigen. And if we now go to individuals with a null mutation, so there's a pure synthetic defect of the virulent factor, so only less virulent factor produced, but factor 8 is produced in normal way, it binds to the virulent factor, and in those individuals, you see an increase in the ratio of factor 8 over virulent factor. Here we had a group of patients with other types of mutations, which we're not sure what they did, but they were either splice site mutations or promoter mutations, also suggesting a decrease in synthesis and again an increase in the factor 8 over the antigen ratio. These were again individuals with normal, uh, uh, with no mutations, and they had a normal factor 8 over antigen ratio varying below 1 to just above one, and the normal propeptide of antigen ratio. But all individuals with missense mutations in this uh, cohort had increase in their propeptide over antigen ratio, and a subset also had an increase of the factor eight over antigen ratio. So these individuals on the right here, they have as well as a synthetic defect in combination with a clearance defect of the protein. So with all these knowledge, we come to a di diagnostic algorithm. So we first measure the antigen and we, uh, and we judge what is uh, coming from that. If the antigen is undetectable or it's below five international units per deciliter, I put this here because in the uh, classification by FN Settle in 2006, the cutoff of five was used because, um, well, many of the antigen assays do not measure very low below uh, five. So for practical reasons, individuals with levels below five could be considered type 3, but there are individuals among those type 3 that actually do have some virulent factor circulating and may more be classified as a severe type of type 1 and not as a type 3. And the solution for that could be including the virulent factor propeptide in the analysis, because if you measure propeptide and there's uh, uh, no propeptide or very low propeptide, then it's really a type 3. But in many individuals with low levels, you can still find uh, very high levels or of or relatively high levels of the propeptide, and then they are a severe type 1. Problem only is that there are no um, assays for the propeptide uh, commercially available right now. If you have uh, the antigen well detectable, then you judge this in combination with the receding cofactor activity. So the ratio of the activity over the antigen, if the ratio is uh, well above 0 0.6, then uh, the, the activity and the antigen are more or less uh, in, in line with each other. Uh, then we judge how is the activity of the factor 8 over the antigen. And if the factor 8 over the antigen has also a ratio above 6, so they are more or less in line, then it's a type 1. But when the factor 8 over the antigen ratio is low, and we have used a cutoff of below 0.6, then it could be a binding defect or a type 2 environment disease. And then you have to include the, fact, the binding assay. If the binding assay shows that there is a reduced binding of factor 8 to virulent factor, then it's a type 2 N. However, if this binding assay comes out normal, you should consider that it may be a mild hemophilia patient. When, however, the activity of the resuscitating cofactor is much lower than the antigen, so below 0.6, then we have to do as a functional defect like type 2, and then we have to subcategorize as a 2A, 2B, or a 2M virulent disease. And for that, we first use the REPA assay. If it is enhanced, as I explained before, then uh, it could be a type 2B or platelet type virulent disease. And often, at this point, when you come here, it's being uh, confirmed by genetic testing. When the REPA is normal or reduced, 
then you uh, need the multimers to make the final distinction between 2A and 2M. Are the multimers, the high molecular multimers, absent? You have a type 2A. But when they are just present, a normal pattern of the multimers, you end up with a type 2M. This seems uh, quite easy, but the main problem is in the type 1s, where you have just somewhat reduced protein. And here you see a cohort of individuals, normal individuals, with their distribution of filament factor. And here you have a cohort of historically diagnosed type 1 patients, and they were remeasured for their filament factor level. And you see that there's a major overlap between normal and uh, type 1. And um, of course, where the green bar is now, that's all normal, but there's some point where you start to be hesitant whether it's still normal or reduced, and then there's a level between, below which you really know it's too low. So it's below 30 or more or less certain because all individuals with levels below 30 really uh, show mutations in the virulent factor gene. But between 30 and 50 or 60, somewhere in this area, you may not be sure, sometimes indicated as low virulent factor because you're not sure whether you really have to do with a genetic defect of virulent factor. But these individuals, when they have a bleeding phenotype, um, may still really are in need for treatment and universally these individuals in this area uh, usually um, have a very good response to DDAVP treatment. So there's an easy treatment for these individuals. When you measure, uh, when you try to detect mutations, then individuals that are very low, below 15 or even below th levels of 30, you find in the majority or 80% of individuals you can identify mutations in the virulent factor gene. But even in this cohort of the European type 1 study, we found in individuals with levels above 45, although they had been diagnosed in the past as a type 1 virulent disease patient based on the bleeding phenotype and the laboratory phenotype, even if there are about 45% uh, of antigen, in half of the patients you can identify a mutation. So we should not neglect those individuals with the levels in the lower range of normal. So to conclude, there's a major heterogeneity in Fovillum disease that necessitates an, uh, a wide uh, array of uh, diagnostic tests. Sometimes they have to be repeated because of variability in the tests. Uh, but for an adequate diagnosis, uh, this is really uh, important uh, for the treatment choice and for counseling. And um, the severity of bleeding phenotype does not always uh, clearly correlate with the uh, test results, and especially in patients with very fast clearance of the protein. The levels may be very low, uh, but inside the endothelium, they probably produce quite a lot of protein, and their uh, clinical phenotype may not be that severe as you would expect based on the levels. All the tests that I describe are all done in plasma actually, but I think for a proper diagnosis and estimation of the, the real clinical bleeding phenotype of the patients, we are in need for tests that actually also incorporate flow and festival in some way. So there's work to do for even better diagnostic tests.